better. Um, thank you all very much for having me. Uh, I am probably your fifth or sixth speaker about Ukraine today, as far as I can tell, but um, I'll try to say some things that are new uh, that may be more said earlier. Uh, the first thing uh, I, I want to give as a theme for my thoughts about where we are is that I believe that most people, people generally, but also in our government, in our allied governments, in media, I don't think they fully appreciate that the Putin's war in Ukraine is a real game-changing event. We are not going back to the world we were in before this. This is something new, and it will lead to things that are new. Uh, so I think that is a fundamental point, and I'll walk through a lot of ways in which I mean that. And one of the ways to start off also as a training point is that I think what we are seeing are the last gasps of World War II and Cold War settlements or lack of settlements. This is now coming to a close. Uh, I listened to Frank Wizard this morning uh, by Zoom. Uh, I've known Frank for many, many years, really admire him. I actually went to Frank and got his advice about how to be a special representative, what, what he did when he was the Kosovo one. I was in the State Department at the time to kind of get his take on that. So I have a great deal of admiration for Frank. But I, I fundamentally disagree with many of the things that he said. And <laughs> I think the, the first um, the first thing, it gets to this framing point. I think Frank, from what I've heard him say this morning, is imagining a world which is going to be similar to the world that we have been living in for the past 50 years or so. Uh, he's imagining a Russia that is a strategic global player, led perhaps by Vladimir Putin, and that is willing to trade and negotiate on a reasonable basis. I don't believe any of those things are true. Uh, I think we have Vladimir Putin has um, directly and repeatedly expressed uh, a fascist and imperialist ideology that is driving him to attack Ukraine, seek to eliminate Ukraine as a country and as a people. He has people going through and eliminating, you know, burning and blowing up libraries and books any um, history that teaches Ukrainian history. Um, he is bringing in teachers from Russia to teach a Russian version of history. He has compared himself to Peter the Great, and he has said that he is an accumulator of Russian lands. He said that Ukrainian people aren't Ukrainians, they're Russians, and they're confused because they've been brainwashed by the West. So, he, and you know, this is, this is coming from the leader of a country whose capital, Moscow, didn't exist when Ukraine existed. So he, he has adopted this imperialist and genocidal or fascist ideology, and he is acting on it. This has done many, many things that, that are some of the game changers that I'm talking about. First off, there was an affinity of Ukrainians for Russians. There, there was a, a sense of being part of the same Slavic family, having a shared history, uh, you know, that they were all in the Soviet Union together. And it was terrible. And Russians suffered under Stalin, just like Ukrainians suffered under Stalin. There was some of this mentality, even though Stalin had special <laughs> attention to the Ukrainians. But that's all gone. Ukraine has gelled as a nation state in a, in a way far stronger and, and irre irreversibly so than was the case before this war. Uh, the Ukrainians are determined to defend their lives, their homes, their family, their territory. They look at the ceasefire from 2014. Remember, Frank said the first step is a ceasefire. Um, they look at the ceasefire from 2014 as setting the conditions for what happened in 2022. And so they look at this as never again. Uh, we, we can't allow Russia to gobble pieces of our territory and keep it because it will just feed the appetite. Uh, another is that Russia has committed really unspeakable war crimes in Ukraine. And these are being very thoroughly documented. 
a colleague of ours, Ambassador Clint Williamson, uh, is uh, Georgetown University now, but he has a contract from the State Department to lead investigations and collection of evidence into the war crimes that Russia committed in Ukraine and support the Ukrainian prosecutor general in this. Um, I'm the founding, one of the founding partners of the American University of Kyiv, and uh, we're providing a home to Clint's efforts and, and administrative support for him in, in Kyiv. And because he was given this contract and, and, and named by the State Department for this role, other countries who know him, uh, including the UK and Germany and the EU itself, have now lent people to his effort as well. So he's actually leading an international consortium of investigators. Clint, I should have added, uh, was a prosecutor at the International Criminal Tribunal in former Yugoslavia, is the lead war crimes investigator in Kosovo, uh, very well known in the EU. So he's collecting the data. Ukrainians are collecting the data. It is reams and reams of incontrovertible information, including that Vladimir Putin is personally responsible for these war crimes. Uh, as an example, after the Ukrainians um, took out part of the Kerch Strait Bridge, uh, they bombed cities, civilians, civilian infrastructure deliberately, and Putin publicly took credit for it and said this is a retaliation. Well, this is him accepting responsibility for the commission of a war crime. So you have all of this. This means that there won't be going back to business as usual with Russia as long as Vladimir Putin is there or the regime is there, because they will be held accountable for war crimes by, by us, by the European Union. Um, no, no one will be able to do business with them normally. Uh, Another game changer here is we've always talked about, and Frank said today as well, that, well, they can never be a member of NATO, and this is too much for Russia. Well, I disagree with that, because I think what we've seen is the absence of NATO membership has been an invitation to war in Europe. Now, where we have gone ahead and extended NATO membership, uh, Putin is deterred, and he, the only countries that he has attacked, Georgia, Ukraine, and then in, a, in not an attack, but an occupation of parts of Moldova are countries that are not part of NATO. And those that are incredibly vulnerable, such as Estonia and Latvia and Lithuania, he has not touched. And I think he believes that the NATO Article 5 guarantee is real. Now, another way to bring up the NATO issue is to say, well, what Ukraine is doing now, being told they can't have NATO membership, is looking for security guarantees. Uh, who will give them a guarantee? Well, the Budapest Memorandum was a security guarantee, and that didn't work. And that was the US, UK, France, and Russia all saying that we'll guarantee the borders. Now they're looking at other countries who might say, yes, we will commit to defend you and arm you and support you and so forth. But think of it this way. Why would the United States do that? Why would we give a security guarantee to Ukraine by ourselves? Why wouldn't we want 30 other countries to be committed to doing it with us as well. That's the deterrent value of NATO. And likewise, if we don't give a security guarantee to Ukraine, who's going to believe the UK, Poland, and Lithuania saying that they're going to defend Ukraine? That, that's not going to deter Russia or mean anything in any way if the US has made clear that we're not. So the only real way forward is for all of us to provide that guarantee through the mechanism that already works, which is NATO membership. The EU, interestingly, has already come to this conclusion that they've already extended candidate status to Ukraine, and they've committed to provide substantial support for Ukrainian reconstruction and recovery. That gives them leverage as well. So it's not just a matter of saying you can become a member of the EU, it's that we're going to give you money to help you rebuild, and as you rebuild, you're going to adopt EU standards. Uh, which is needed in Ukraine, frankly, as well. So I think EU membership for Ukraine is real. I think NATO membership for Ukraine will become real once the war is done. Um, another piece of this, which um, I'm sure Jennifer talked about in the panel because she gave me a readout of it, is we're seeing the end of the, um, the myth of the Russian military as we've known it. Uh, we all believed that the Russian military was rebuilt after the collapse of the Soviet Union and quite capable and something that we were going to have to prepare and defend against in the future, perhaps. Well, two things have happened. First off, 
we have seen that it's a hollow shell, that it is not capable. They have problems with manpower, they have problems with training, they have problems with equipment maintenance, they have problems with, with corruption and scavenging and, and you know, cannibalization of equipment, they have problems with command and control, they have problems with leadership, they have problems with morale and motivation. Um, they have been you know, incapable of performing as a modern military throughout this entire conflict. And because of that, they have lost over half their combat capability, their, their conventional combat capability. Uh, they have just burnt through it. Um, and in this recent um, counteroffensive that Ukraine launched east of Kharkiv in September, uh, they collected about 100 uh, Russian tanks, along with other armored personnel carriers and artillery. So <clears throat> the Russians are leaving and even abandoning their equipment and the Ukrainians have been absorbing that into their own military in addition to what we're giving them. So we see a picture here of Ukraine surviving as a sovereign, independent European democracy. We see a picture of Russia being a pariah state as long as Putin is in charge or his forces are occupying parts of Ukraine against Ukraine's will. We see a Russian military that is nothing really for us to worry about very much in the future, only nuclear weapons. And there again, we see that nuclear deterrence is actually working. Uh, so those are all big changes and adding to that European Union membership, NATO membership, um, closing gray zones in Europe will be fundamentally adding to security in Europe. Bringing Ukraine into the EU will actually revive European economic growth. Uh, think about a country, I'll just, you know, just take it in the abstract, a country that has vast territory, large, one of the largest in Europe. It has natural resources, including minerals, rare earth minerals, min, um, uh, iron and other deposits, coal deposits, has energy resources, oil, gas, coal, very favorable conditions for renewable energy, including land-based wind, land-based solar, sea-based wind, and green hydrogen. It has a very talented, well-educated population, has the second largest tech sector in Europe. Uh, it is undervalued, in the second, second lowest GDP per capita in Europe. Their GDP has gone down 50% this year because of the war. So this is a bargain. It is a country poised for rapid economic growth when the war is over. Uh, it is a place that through its growth will be fueling European growth. It will provide manpower, which the EU lacks like we do. Uh, it is um, going to be a revival of uh, Europe's economy at the same time that it will have the largest and best equipped military in Europe and a, and a boost to NATO as well. So I think that's where all of this is headed. Uh, now, it'll take, you know, at least a year, maybe two, maybe more for this to play out. And I think our responsibility then as a country, uh, as, as the United States and as part of a NATO alliance, mm -hmm. is to be steady. That we are doing the right thing by helping the Ukrainians defend themselves. They are strategically weakening one of our main adversaries, which is useful for them to do a very low cost and risk to the United States. They are building a better Europe and they're going to be laying the foundations for future economic uh, development. Uh, so I think we get a lot out of this. And answering the question that was asked about China, you know, what do we get out of this? This is Jim's question. Same thing on here. What do we get out of this? We, we get a lot out of uh, support for Ukraine that we're giving. I was um, not at all concerned about the midterm elections. Uh, I know many of the Republicans uh, on the Hill and staffers on the Hill, and I've had a chance to brief them many times. They're very, very supportive of Ukraine. There are outliers in both parties who uh, are calling for you know, Ukraine to give away territory or to negotiate or you know, do something. Uh, because they don't want the war to continue. But that's a minority, and it will remain a minority under the new Congress. Would have been the case whether the Republicans took the Senate or whether they do take the Senate or not, and certainly in the House. And I thought McCarthy's, uh, future Speaker McCarthy's statement of no blank check is entirely appropriate, because there shouldn't be a blank check. <laughs> there, there should be accountability, there should be transparency, there should be congressional oversight, and we should continue to proceed 
along those lines. And there shouldn't be any hesitation about that. So I think it was um, whipped up into you know, a, a bit of hysteria over uh, always going to cut off aid, which I don't see to be the case at all. Now, final point I wanted to make is it comes to a, uh, well, actually, I have one more thing I want to say because we had the China conversation, and I'll come to my final point. But on China, um, we had a nice conversation at lunch here saying, uh, re referencing Bridge Colby's book, uh, where Bridge is arguing that uh, China wants to be a regional hegemon in Asia. And if it succeeds in absorbing Taiwan fully, then that will cow everybody else into Asia into viewing them as the center kingdom, and, and that'll be it. Uh, so Taiwan being the linchpin. But I would say that the Chinese are watching very carefully what happens in Ukraine. Ukraine is a smaller population by about half, maybe, no, not by about half, I take that back, but a smaller population than uh, Taiwan. It is um, weaker economically by far, and yet it is defending itself very successfully against Russia, in fact, pushing Russia back, Russia has fundamentally weakened itself for a generation by this war. And the West proved to be far more capable and organized and determined in helping Ukraine than anyone expected. So watching all of this, I think the Chinese must already have concluded, uh, take your time on Taiwan, don't rush. Doesn't mean they're giving up the goal of, of absorbing Taiwan fully, but don't rush. And what are the lessons you learn from the Russian side of it? Well, don't destroy the target. <laughs> you, you want to take in a rich Taiwan, not a destroyed Taiwan. Uh, don't unify the West. Do this gradually. Um, don't commit all of these war crimes and all of these horrendous things which will unify the world against you. Um, view yourself in, from a position of strength where you are a rising power and you have time as opposed to a position of a declining power such as Russia. So I think all of those things are lessons for China that they will, that they will get out of this. Now to the negotiations point, because this is, I think, topical, it's coming up everywhere now. Uh, we had the 30 progressive members of the House sign this letter and then retract it, which Frank uh, mentioned this morning. We had Frank calling for negotiations. We had um, Jake Sullivan visiting Kiev and meeting with Zelensky and saying he needs to show that he is willing to negotiate with Russia. Uh, we had Jake talking with the Russians, Petrushev and Ushakov, uh, which was reported in the Washington Post over the weekend. So a couple things about negotiations. First off, Vladimir Putin has no interest in negotiations. He has staked out in very strong ideological terms goals that are about the destruction of Ukraine, the accumulation of Ukrainian territory, the annexation, which has already been passed through the Duma and signed by him of these four provinces of Ukraine in addition to Crimea. Um, he is not interested in negotiating a solution. He is interested in seeing if he can get for free what he otherwise is trying to fight for. Uh, so that, that's his mindset. Urging the Ukrainians to negotiate about what exactly? <laughs> what would they negotiate about? Would the, because the Ukrainian position, as Vladimir Zelensky expressed uh, uh, to the COP27 conference in Cairo yesterday, uh, is we should get our territory back. Russia should pay reparations. There needs to be accountability for war crimes. There need to be security guarantees in the future that this doesn't happen again. Perfectly reasonable position. There is no way that Vladimir Putin's going to do this. So what are we saying when we say negotiate? We're saying give up territory? If I were Ukrainian and the Germans came to me and said, you know, why don't you give away Donbass or give away Crimea, that'll make them happy. I'd say, why don't you give away Munich? <laughs> you know, that might make the German, that might make the Russians happier. <laughs> Given that, or you know, if the Americans do this, <laughs> yeah, or you know, why don't you give Alaska back? <laughs> See how that works. <laughs> so uh, this is not going to have uh, have any positive effect of urging negotiations. Now, uh, the Russians need 
to see that they are losing on the battlefield, which they are slowly, but they are. And Putin has put himself into an untenable position. He has declared goals in Ukraine that he cannot achieve militarily. And he is weakening his country in the process. And everybody in Russia knows it. When you launch a mobilization and you say, we're going to put 300,000 more people in the military and more people leave the country than get mobilized, that tells you that the society knows the game is up. That they, they know this is not working. Similar on the economy, they know it's not working. That you've had, uh, my wife is originally from, from Georgia, and you've had over 100,000 Russians, many of them young men, but 100,000 Russians leave Russia to come to Georgia with their money and their automobiles and just, you know, dig in for the long haul. Um, so people are protecting their lives, they're protecting their pocketbooks, they're protecting their families by getting out of Putin's Russia. So th this tells you all you need to know about how things are going in Russia. What will happen here, in my prediction, and, and uh, I read ISW religiously every day as well, so I, I am informed by them, but my prediction is that this isn't going to look a lot different for the rest of this year. You'll see gains by the Ukrainians. They're going to be careful retaking Kherson because they don't want to fall into a trap. They are going to make gains in Luhansk province, and they're going to make gains in Zaporizhia in the direction of Mariupol, um, maybe cutting off that landline of communication. That's their next big objective. And I think they see the east and the western front coming down in a simultaneous fashion because that will have the effect of isolating Crimea. So that's what I think we're going to see play out gradually this, this fall. The Russians will have a hard winter. People keep thinking that the Ukrainians will have a hard winter. The Russians will have a hard winter because unlike Napoleon's forces or Hitler's forces, now it's the Russians that are deployed. They're the ones that have to have food and fuel and ammunition and, and the local population is against them. So it's, they're going to have a very hard winter. And next, next spring, summer, uh, they'll be falling back again. And I think that is the most likely time you're going to see people in Russia saying, okay, what do we do about Putin? Because he's gotten us into something that is destroying the country here and this can't continue much longer. Uh, so I think the, the, the right approach to negotiation is to keep the pressure and the dynamics in place that are currently in place, which will then force change in Russia that will then create the conditions where you can then bring about a settlement. But as long as Putin is there and determined to throw everything he can at the destruction of Ukraine, uh, which will not succeed and will destroy his own country, then we let that go and we wait for the opportunity when there is change, when you can do something. So I will pause there and I look forward to hearing comments and questions. Hi, good to see you. Yes. Very interesting. I agree with, I think, 100% of what you said. <laughs> S seri seriously, that, that this is a game changer. That, that's the big idea, and I agree with that 100%. I want to go back to one historical detail to just get your perspective on. It did not surprise me that the Ukrainians fought back very hard and have been relentless. I've only been to Ukraine once, but I, that didn't surprise me at all. What surprised me was that the U.S. government, I think, unless I've got bad information, as you said, really was surprised at how weak the Russian army was. Yes. Why is our intelligence of the Russian army so bad? That's a great question. And I remember um, when I was at the National Security Council, and we're, this is the first term of the Bush administration, so 2001 to 2005, and we were getting our analysis of Russia from the intelligence community. And we had a couple analysts detailed to the NSC who were supplying some of this as well. And I remember that they were wrong then. <laughs> is that they were always looking at things as if Russia had a point, that they're justified in what they're doing, and that they are incredibly capable and we have to be careful. 
And I remember arguing at the time, because we were talking about NATO enlargement, we we're talking about the Baltic states, you know, Romania and yeah. so forth, joining the EU, I'm sorry, joining NATO. And we were getting warned and warned and warned about this. Oh, this is terrible, don't do this, don't do this. And said, no, this is the absolute right thing to do because Russia doesn't have a right to, to decide about other people. And uh, it has always been that way. Now, there's a technical side to this where um, we overestimated the actual capability of the Russian military. This is probably similar to what happened with Saddam Hussein. They lie to themselves and to their leaders. And so we listen to the lies and believe them. <laughs> so I think that's one big dynamic. And then the other dynamic is, is what I said about um, an, a, a bizarre um, sympathy for looking at the world through a Russian prism of grievance, which doesn't have, you know, is not something we should be sympathetic to. Uh, the, yeah, you can, you can get me going on this, but uh, to suggest that NATO enlargement is a reason why Russia is justified in invading Ukraine, I mean, this is, this is incredible. Uh, because first off, we, we told Ukraine, yeah, you can be a member of NATO someday back in 2008. And for 14 years, nothing happened. So to think that this is now imminent and needs to be stopped by a war is crazy. Second, it, it accepts the Russian premise that um, they get to decide over what other people do. And, you know, you know, the Romanians or the, the, the Baltic states, they, they feel like it's their country <laughs> and they, we get to decide what we want to do. And similar with the Ukrainians, it's they don't see themselves as, as being written off to Russia somehow. But somehow, I think our intelligence uh, analysts have adopted this view that, well, that's the Russian point of view and we need to understand it. Sorry, sorry. No, Phil, Phil is the moderator. I apologize. Uh, before before I uh, um, pass the baton to you, I, I'm going to call on myself a question. Um, I don't want to get too bookish on everyone, but uh, in some recent books that have been published about Russia and Putin, you might say that there are two different models for what's going on here uh, and what's driving Putin. Yours is the, what you've presented to us is a kind of raison d'etat model that that Putin, mm -hmm. uh, Angela Stent, I think, would embrace this in her uh, Putin's world book. Mm -hmm. That Putin is driven by the ambition to restore Russian greatness, to restore the Russian Empire, to overcome the historic calamity at the, as he considers at the collapse of mm -hmm. the Soviet Union, uh, and that that that's what's really uh, driving the train here. But others who focus on the, the, the essential nature of Putin's model of political control, or put differently, the essential corruption of his regime, mm -hmm. say Anders Aslund or uh, Karen Dawisha in their books on Putin's corruption, would say, well, no, wait a minute, these small victorious wars, a phrase that is attributed to a long ago czarist minister, small victorious wars are a necessary accessory of a regime that is essentially a kleptocracy. You can only keep stripping assets from the state, stealing the state blind, uh, uh, enriching your plutocrats and impoverishing others if you can distract the public with nationalistic victories and that this is just the biggest small victorious war that he had planned, and he just bit off more than he could chew. Yeah. Which is the right model, do you think? They're kind of two yeah, different models. Yeah, I don't think that they're inconsistent with each other, though. I think there's a dynamic of both. I think that Putin, um, I think he is personally mainly driven by his sense of history and legacy. Uh, he does view the collapse of the Soviet Union as a great tragedy. He blames the West for this. He uh, viewed the Soviet leaders as failures because they failed to protect the state and to, to build it. They lost territories. And he fashions himself the, 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 the new czar, the builder, the Peter the Great, etc. 
And I think this was COVID enhanced, that being isolated as much as he was for such a long time, he, he stewed in his own ideology and believed it more and more. And he had intelligence services that didn't tell him the truth about anything. So because they would get chopped off if they did. So I think there's all of that. But you touched on something. It's actually uh, I'm teaching a class this year at Arizona State University, and it's the first lecture that is there, which is it's fundamentally about transatlantic relations. But the starting point is that the, the fundamental struggle uh, in human society is the relationship of people and government. It's either people get to choose their government and they are citizens and they have ownership or small groups of people form a government and rule over others. And it's that fight between these two systems that is defining everything. And in that, Putin, Xi, the, the, the Ayatollahs in Iran, in Maduro, you know, they have the small group dictatorship syndrome. And almost without fault, nations that are organized that way are violent and aggressive. Uh, because they have to actually fight to hold power and they seek to project external aggression as a way of, um, of, in, of fanning the flames of nationalism and patriotism to keep people on side. And Putin has done this himself as well, very Machiavellian sense when, you know, even coming to power and blowing up the apartments in Moscow or with the wars in Chechnya. Uh, but then this latest one, it is too much. He did bite off too much. I think he thought, as we saw with a very public rally that he held back in February, that no, we're we're you know you know great huge country. We're we're righting the wrongs of the past and did it at a football stadium and all these cheering people who were bust in. Uh, so he he's de he was definitely trying to rally the people but he was also doing it for his own perceptions of his own legacy. Thanks for being here. Um, what does winning look like from the Ukrainian perspective? And secondly, I'm just curious of your view about whether nuclear, uh, the nuclear threat is a real one. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure it's a real one, but what do you think about it? Well, I think winning has very different um, very different shading to it. The most fundamental of these is Ukraine survives as a sovereign, independent European democracy. Full stop. Now, that means the fighting is about the borders. The fighting is about the arrangements with Russia. The fighting is about what type of regime Russia has there. The fighting is about, well, what are the guarantees in the future? All of these things, you know, they, they have to get sorted out. But Ukraine wins by being Ukraine, which Putin sought to exterminate. Is there an that? Well, I, yeah, so, <laughs> you know, you know, um, you never want to make predictions, especially about the future. <laughs> but um, I think that if you look at what happened to Gorbachev, you look at what happened to Khrushchev, at a certain point, Putin will be at Sochi and the guards are going to change. And then they're going to have some National Security Council meeting to say we're we're reorganizing some things. And by the way, our great leader is is uh, suffering from a little bit uh, more severe illness. You all knew he had something. And we're we're hoping he gets better soon. <laughs> so that's I think the kind of thing that happens. And I I would expect it to be before we're meeting here again next year. Uh, but this is just my speculating out you know what it could be now what could cause something like that um maybe a massive uh, ukrainian victory in some battle where it's really incontrovertible that this this just collapsed the russian forces maybe it is the ukrainians taking sevastopol or at least knocking it out um, maybe it's the kurt Strait bridge going down who knows what would precipitate that but i think that's the direction it's heading in um, no, uh, well, no, no let, me, let me say yes, actually. I do think nuclear threat is real, but I don't think it is a high likelihood. So 
if, if before February we were expecting zero chance of a use of nuclear weapons, I think now we're more than zero and less than 10. But the way I play this out in my mind is that, well, the first use of nuclear weapons is strategic. That is to say, will they attack us? Will they attack our allies? And here, I think no, because I think everyone knows in Russia that that will destroy Russia. Then you have a tactical use of a nuclear weapon on the battlefield, low yield, you know, you could even grade eight, you know, what the yield would be. And I think here, my reading is first, it wouldn't achieve a military objective. Uh, you wouldn't be able to take the territory that you have just made uninhabitable. They don't have their forces prepared for this. They, they would destroy as much of their own forces as they would the Ukrainians. We have been clear warning them that any use of nuclear weapons would be met with devastating consequences for the Russian military. I think that's a very precise and useful statement. I'm very glad that that's what the administration has done because we need the Russian military to understand this so that they don't want to push the trigger even if Putin orders them to. And I think, I think they are in that stage there. Um, and I think with, with devastating consequences, I think what they interpret that to mean is we would knock out their command and control and ability to continue the operations in Ukraine and maybe knock out the Black Sea Fleet. So these are things that they don't want. So I think that that warning is there. Um, and then finally, I think we need to make one more point better than we have. Fortunately, she and Modi and Erdogan are making it for us. Uh, but we should also be saying it. It's not even only about you is that any situation where any country uses a nuclear weapon as a part of a military tactic to gain on the battlefield is unacceptable because we don't want to be in that world where nuclear weapons are used. So if you do it, we will, we will be in there. We will go after this because we don't want to create a situation where others think they can. Uh, we haven't made that point strongly enough. Thank you. Terrific remarks. Enjoyed them. Thank you. And thanks for being with us. So let's assume that uh, Jennifer, who spoke to us this morning, is correct and that Ukraine will be more and more victorious on the battlefield and push Russia back to their borders. Uh, the question is just a matter of timing. If it happens next year, great, because that means you could make a deal with Russia at that point, or Russia, as you put it, Putin gets removed and the new, his successor makes a deal to end the war and gas flows again to Europe. But let's say that doesn't happen. There's enough energy apparently to get through this winter in Europe, but the following winter doesn't look so great for Europe. Would the European resolve start to dissipate after a cold winter with no energy, what do they do? Mm -hmm. And uh, you know what happens if it drags into 2024? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Uh, starting from that reference point, I think Europe has done more to assure alternative sources of energy um, than even they expected to do. Uh, Germany, in particular, has filled up its coffers, 95% underground storage. They've left on their nuclear reactors and are going to sell electricity to France in exchange for France providing more gas to Germany. They've contracted to get gas from Azerbaijan, from Qatar. They have decided to uh, put in place five floating LNG terminals. That'll take them a year or two, but the, it's faster than building a, a land-based one because you can float them in. Uh, the British have decided to start extracting let's see gas again, which means they won't need to buy it from Norway, so Norway can put more gas in toward Europe. Uh, the new Italian government uh, is positioning itself to be an energy hub for Europe as well. They again, these are a couple of year long projects, but they see uh, Eastern Med gas coming to Italy, 
They see getting gas from Libya. They see building a pipeline from Spain to Italy to get LNG that goes to Spain to Italy and up into Europe. And they see themselves building a couple more uh, LNG terminals uh, because they, they want to seize this position now of an energy hub uh, under the, the Brothers of Italy government. So I think that they are doing more than um, we expected them to or they expected to. And I think that they are prepared to get through next year as well. Now, the publics, of course, you know, inflation in Europe and energy prices in Europe are even worse than here. And the publics are upset about it. And you've seen protests in France and you've seen protests uh, in Italy, and no doubt that will happen. But at the same time, you have incredibly strong European public support for Ukraine, <laughs> largely because of the war crimes. And, and I mentioned this in the context of how, what she is learning from this. The war crimes have given European governments a reprieve from their own publics when they have to make some of these difficult decisions. And I think they have fundamentally made them already. The other thing that's happened uh, as a result of all of this uh, is uh, um, energy markets in Europe have flipped in favor of renewable energy. Meaning it used to be more costly to produce renewable energy than to produce electricity based on oil or gas uh, or coal, uh, because traditional fossil fuel energy sources. That's not true right now. It's actually cheaper to produce the renewables. And this is going to accelerate the European investment in renewable energy production, which they've wanted to do but now it's going to be economically more viable and that's going to help take some of the pressure off as well. And then a final point on this, I mentioned, you know, how you need to look at Ukraine as an asset for Europe. Uh, imagine investing in Ukrainian solar and wind and hydrogen production on a kind of free trade zone basis where the Europeans put in billions of euros investment, you produce green electricity and you export that back to the EU. Uh, that then helps the EU get off of the oil and Russian gas, it drives down consumer prices, it helps them meet their green energy targets, and it provides a business basis for growing Ukraine's economy rather than a, a handout basis. So I think that is a, a very viable idea that I'm pushing and I think we'll probably get, get somewhere under the, the next couple of EU presidencies and G7 chairmanships. Which you got? Um, so, <laughs> the Ukrainian Kurds, 